just now this guy. I mean, this is just one of the letters that we get. We get, uh, I guess, 30 to 100 letters every week. And this one's from Christopher McIntyre in Woodville, Ohio. But it gives you the sense of here you are. You're a small business. You're an entrepreneur. You're out there for the first time. And as soon as you open the door, here comes the government. And so you have to work your way past the government to be able to get to work. And it's a very interesting. How many of you have run a small business? Can, can you all, a good number of you, can you all identify with his? Okay. But you have to ask yourself, I mean, this is not an act of nature. Governments are creations of free will. So if it's a dumb thing to do, we do have the option of not doing it. I mean, I, this is radical. You have the option of redesigning it so as not to be dumb. Okay? Very important part of what we're trying to do here is say, it, it, one of the lessons of American civilization is to stop being dumb. That's what pragmatism based, I mean, pragma, if you think about it, I mean, just think about the word pragmatism. Pragmatism, in a very real sense, was a philosophy that said, try not to be dumb. I mean, when you, when you, you know, and, 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 you, and you used to see it in the old movies where you'd, you'd have the, the cowboy and you'd have the English duke who'd arrive, and the English duke would be wearing all these fancy European clothing and carrying all these books and doing all these European things, and the cowboy would sort of say, you know, probably riding across the desert in Arizona, it's just as well not to do those things. And, of course, the Englishman would say, well, of course we have to do these things. After all, that's how we aristocrats are. And the cowboy or the Indian scout or whatever would then say, well, of course you can do those things, but this is not going to be good. And of course, the whole rest of the movie would be gradually the guy learning how to dress like an American, act like an American, etc. So by the end of the movie, when the Englishman who had now been Americanized got back to England, people were going, why are you doing that? Now, true pragmatism would recognize that it is fine to wear wool in Scotland and not as smart to wear it in the Arizona desert. So that, in fact, there's no right. I mean, it, it, the, the right thing in the Arizona desert is, is the wrong thing in Scotland. I'm not, I'm not arguing that, that uh, the deer slayer would do better or, you know, uh, from the last of the Mohicans if we sent him to Scotland. What I'm arguing is that American pragmatism basically started with the idea, do what works. Don't do what's dumb. I mean, and again, this, this, this is so basic that it often sounds, I feel like I also, I mean, I almost want to remind you, you know, I have a PhD and I'm Speaker of the House. And I'm, not, I'm not just making these things up so that they sound odd. <laughs> but you now have a high culture, an elite culture, which is so nutty that to wander in and say, why don't we quit doing the dumb ones? Just, and people go, well, you can't do that. But of course you can do that. That's what a free society is all about. It's about the right to adapt and change. In the declaration. Yeah, it's in the oh, is it in the Declaration? Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. What does it say? Um that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute a new government, having its foundations on such principles and organizations, its powers in such form, as to them uh, shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. So, in other words, the Founding Fathers would think it was all right to quit being dumb. <laughs> See? I, I know this, you know, but I'm trying to... Okay? I'm just trying to, I'm trying to lay out here in very simple English what is really a very radical thought. When you run into something which is destructive, stop doing it. If you applied that across, Drucker had a, a way of saying it. He said, uh, he, said, what, one, he said, at least once a year, walk through everything you're doing and ask the question, would you start it? And if the answer is no, why are you still doing it? And you apply that test, it is amazing how much stuff you change. Now, we also want to, frankly, in, that, in the current setting, cut the size of government. On every government dollar, we should ask, is it more productive than the same dollar spent in the private sector? It's a very important challenge. Because in an entrepreneurial society, the question is, who is more likely to create the next 1,000 jobs, Norman Brinker or a Department of Labor bureaucrat? Very important question, because guess, guess where the welfare state would tend to spend the money? They would tax Brinker and his investors to transfer the money to the bureaucrat in the Department of Labor. Or the Department of Commerce. I'm not trying to pick on one department, I'm trying to give you a model. So you want to shrink the size of government to maximize the resources available to entrepreneurial behavior. Which is why limited government, low taxes, balanced budgets, and stable money, what I think I'd call honest money, are the core lessons of Smith, Hayek, Schumpeter, and Friedman. 
that all of them argued again and again for the last uh, 220 years that you want government to be very limited, not to be weak, to do very well the limited things it does. You want low taxes so most resources stay with entrepreneurs. You want balanced budgets because you want to force priorities and force decisions to keep the government limited. And finally, you want money to be stable, or I, I would describe it as honest money. That is, if the government gives you a dollar and you save that dollar, then 10 years from now you should be able to cash that dollar in and it should still be a dollar. Very, very key idea in the Constitution. The Constitution is a very anti-inflationary document, which is why it, they literally wrote in you can't repudiate the debt. You have to pay the interest on the debt because they were very determined to minimize inflation. Remember that money is both a medium of exchange. I give you a dollar, you give me a goodie. And it's a store of value. I give you a dollar, you want it to still be a dollar. And so the idea in the theoretical model was you had very limited government, you had balanced budgets, you kept most resources in the private sector, and most of those resources could be stored in, in, in a currency which would not lose value. And that was the core model of, of the entrepreneurial system uh, under Alexander Hamilton and others. And for the government that does remain, which will still be frankly pretty big, you want to apply quality to turn second wave bureaucracies into third wave citizen oriented service organizations. That is, again and again you want to say to people, how can we recreate customer behavior in the bureaucracy? So that instead of bureaucrats seeing you as trapped, they see you as a customer to be served. And how do you get the kind of speed and effectiveness in government that you would normally expect in, in a private sector? One example of that is you want to reshape our foreign service so that it helps Americans create local jobs through world sales. So you want, you want to, we, we for 50 years focused our foreign service on defeating the Soviet Empire. It's gone. Well, I think we now want to say, all right, how do we compete across the planet? What do we do in order to be able to make sure that Americans are selling everywhere? You also want to draw a distinction between what government does and what government makes happen. This was the essence of Hamilton's uh, uh, policies. The thing we can say, we want, we want something, uh, building the transcontinental railroads. One way to have built the transcontinental railroads would have been to set up the Federal Department of Transcontinental Railroads and have the Corps of Engineers build it. We did that with the Panama Canal, which was a big, so big a project and so unusual that we actually had the Corps of Engineers build the Panama Canal. But for the transcontinental railroads, what we said was, we'll give you land and we'll give you cash if you'll build the railroads. So you had a lot of entrepreneurs rushing around trying to build railroads for about a 35-year period. Uh, we, wanted, we wanted air travel around the world, so we, had, we subsidized Pan Am. Much of the early rise of the domestic airlines industry was uh, paid for by uh, airmail, which subsidized their routes. So there are a lot of ways the government can shape things. We can change tax laws to shape behavior. You can say, uh, we want more scientists, so if you can score above 1,300 in math and science, we'll give you an automatic four-year four scholarship to the school of your choice. And if you'll continue to major in math and science, we'll guarantee you a graduate fellowship. And you'd see a shift. You'd see people responding to the incentives. That's different than the government doing it directly. We want to encourage people to buy uh, homes, so we give you a mortgage deduction on your house. The result is people have a propensity to buy homes, and, and people do. How many of you have thought about tax consequences when you think about your home mortgage? All right? 